everybody. We're the Good Doctors of Abbey Research. I'm Dr. Aaron. I'm Dr. Kristen. And you're very welcome to our discussion of the mini series, limited series, Dope Sick. We are talking today about episode one entitled First Bottle. Uh, you guys should be aware, if you don't already know, this show has a lot to do with addiction and all the things that go with it. So consider this your content warning. If those are topics that are challenging for you to listen to and discuss, uh, they certainly are for us as human beings with varying experiences. Um, but we weren't originally going to talk about this show. We decided to add it in once it came out. We watched a couple episodes together on a work trip and we were like, wait a second, we should talk about this. So the Too Long Didn't Read recap of the show, first of all, um, and this episode, uh, it jumps between several time periods, and this episode starts that time jump. Um, so we start in 1986, which is when uh, Richard Sackler, executive at Purdue Pharma, comes to the rest of the Sackler family to tell them that he wants to create this drug called OxyContin, eventually. Um, then there's the 1996 time period, which is the year that the drug is formally launched. Then there's the 2000s, early to mid 2000s. We see a grand jury investigation and a grand jury actually convening. And then the late 90s we get into as well, which is when we start to get into the nuts and bolts of the opioid crisis. So this episode and all episodes jump between those three time periods. It was a little confusing for me at the beginning, but I eventually, once I realized what was happening in each time period, I could pick out like why we were jumping. Um, and I should say here, this is based okay. on Beth Macy's book, Dope Sick, yes. which we've reviewed, I reviewed on, on our sister channel, Abby Research Reads. So if you want to hear about the book, which I think is incredible, very well researched, um, and very engaging narratively. The link will be in the show notes here. If you'd rather read this story than watch it, they are different mediums and both are impactful. Yeah, thank you for, for that. I, I forgot to mention it. And what's important to know is this is a quasi-fictionalized or dramatized retelling of the book. And the book is nonfiction. So all of the all of the people in the show are real people, except for, I believe, Caitlin Deaver's character. Who yeah, she's is an amalgamation. An, an, of amalgam yeah. an amalgamation of some, of some folks. Um, but certainly the um, U.S. Uh, attorney, special prosecutors, uh, Rosario Dawson's character, Bridget, and Dr. Phoenix, played by the beloved Pittsburgh native Michael Keaton. Those are all real folks. Um, but, you know, things are dramatized for the sake of television. Um, but it it feels like you're watching a drama, but it is about real people. So First Bottle is about the development of the drug and how they came to this idea that they needed to cure the world of its pain. I wish I was kidding when I said that out loud, but that is what Richard Sackler believed, question mark, or he wanted to make money juries out on uh, how sincere he was. But the big problem that we learn right from the get-go is that Purdue Pharma claimed that Oxycontin was non-addictive. Uh, their very often quoted um, statistic that less than 1% of users become addicted. And so that is our starting off point, really, at the trial, in the, the grand jury trial in 2005. And then we go back to look at how these storylines develop. And we meet Dr. Phoenix, played by Michael Keaton, um, and this idea of selling the first bottle of Oxycontin and how they chose the locations that they chose. They chose um, Virginia, rural Virginia, rural Kentucky, and Maine because they were all industrial centers where people have a high rate of injury on the job. And so they were like, oh, these people are in a lot of pain we can help them. She uses inverted commas because she feels very strongly about how much help these people gave them. Um, and then we see the, um, the two U.S. attorneys also developing this understanding of what they think is happening with Oxycontin. 
um, and they go to their boss and they want to start investigating. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're like, oh, we can't go after a publicly traded company. And that's where we learn that the Sacklers are not publicly traded. They're privately owned by a bunch of wealthy philanthropists. Um, and we see through this episode the development of what became the modus operandi for selling drugs in the 90s which is these highly trained uh, sales reps who would travel to all these small towns with their drugs. And this was, what was the Jake Gyllenhaal movie with a oh, flip where he was Love like and Other a, Drugs? The one Love with, and Other Drugs where he the was one a Viagra. With Hathaway? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Where he was a Viagra salesperson. Like, it's very similar to that. Like, they would go to these locations, they wine and dine the doctors, they get on the good graces of the receptionist, and this was all part of selling the drug and marketing the drug. And for a couple minor pieces of backstory here that are given more in um, Patrick Radden Keefe's incredible book on the Sackler family, The Empire of Pain, Ooh. which is all of this was actually invented by the Sackler family. Yeah. Modern drug advertising as we know it. And like, if you hate how drugs are advertised in the United States, you can blame the Sackler family because That's it was right. Arthur Sackler who came up with everything. He was originally hired by Pfizer um, and then he worked for Roche for a little while. Um, he invented pharmac pharmacological advertising. And then his nephew, Richard, just kind of perfected it. Like um, ramped so it up. All, all, like they are the industry leader in selling their, their products. Um, and they are highly, un, to this day, un, under-regulated because they are not publicly traded. Um, so I'll, I will pause here again. I have an intro rant before we discuss the, the thing, but I want Erin to finish. But to explain to you guys as she's talking about this, the Sacklers are why this happens, not just because of Oxy. Like, they built the system in which this enters. Right, and, and we don't get that so much in the first episode, but in later episodes where um, Richard Sackler starts to talk about uh, the things that his uncle Arthur did. By the time we enter um, in 1986, Arthur Sackler is already dead, but this is very much his legacy mm -hmm. of what he developed when he was a, a pharma industry executive in various places, as Dr. Kristen said, um, and then eventually building uh, up Purdue Pharma with the Sacklers. Um, it's a really strange bunch of, of humans, the Sacklers, and, and we get some insights into that um, in the next episode in terms of the three patriarchal brother Sacklers, Arthur, Mortimer, and Richard. But Arthur's dead, and so Mortimer and Richard's kids are, like, battling it out, and it's, it's, it's some nutty stuff. But we'll wrap up the summary by saying what we learn at the end of this episode is that uh, our good old friends, the uh, FDA, are a huge part of why Oxy becomes so big so quickly. And it's because the most effective selling point for uh, Oxycontin is that it was given a special label. And this is uh, like, I had no idea that this happened. So this was a huge, like, eye opening thing for me. It was it is a class two narcotic because it is a class two narcotic, but it was given a special label that reinforces that it was non addictive. So because the FDA did that, it jumped the hurdle that a lot of doctors would have in prescribing a class two drug for moderate pain. We learn at the end of the episode that the medical review officer at the FDA, a gentleman named Curtis Wright, left two years after ramming through this label, and you guessed it, kids, joined Purdue Pharma. So I wish I could say that was an exceptional circumstance. That is actually the norm for how regulatory agencies work, whether it's the FDA or the DOD or whatever. Um, but that is what we learn specifically about the drug. And then at the end of the episode, we uh, have met Caitlin Deaver's character, Betsy. She gets injured working in the mines in um, Finch Creek, Virginia. And she is given and prescribed Oxycontin by Dr. Phoenix. And that's where we get the first bottle. And that's where the episode ends. Dr. Kristen, take it away. A couple of things off the bat here, folks. 
in academia, we deeply believe in disclosing things up front so that you know the perspective by which people are coming from. So here at Abbey Research, we believe addiction is a disease. And part of that reason is that because especially opioids literally rewrite your brain chemistry. And they, they get into that in the show, but I want to say that really up front. Um, we believe it is a disease. We believe that the people who are afflicted by this um, are rewritten into different versions of themselves that they have very limited control over. And mm -hmm. the choice to become sober is a hero's journey. And we have absolutely nothing but respect for everybody who attempts and to, to get sober, however many times they have to attempt that. And the people who remain sober are just the unsung heroes of the planet. We can't speak highly enough of them. It is a incredible decision to overcome either generational DNA or the rewriting of your DNA based on this drug or both as it is for a lot of, a lot of folks. So mm. that up front, if that is not an opinion that you share and you are open to hearing why we think that we, in we invite you to continue to join us. Um, we will not be engaging in um, debates as to whether or not it is a disease. This is a, this is a fact in which we are moving forward. Number two um, I have personally loved a lot of people who were addicted to Oxy in particular. So this is a, um, and some of them are dead now. And some of them are with us and are fighting sobriety and are doing it every day. And I, so this is a deeply personal story for me, which is one of the reasons we didn't want to cover it. We weren't sure if I could be um, human about it and not a fireball of rage. Um, because I need you to understand that... Um, Truly the only people on the planet for whom I can't extend empathy is the Sackler family um, and the people, the, the executives at Purdue Pharma. Um, I have known about this story that Dr. Aaron is encountering now. I've known for about five, six years the depths at to which the Sacklers went to addict half the country to their drug um, on some level. The statistics are insane um, mm -hmm. of people who have been exposed to um, this drug, half the country addicted to it is an, is an oversimplification, but it is significantly more than we actually even document because of the shame around addiction. So mm -hmm. I'll say all of that. Um, I cannot recommend highly enough, not only Beth Lacey's book, if you want to read, but also, um, Empire of Pain, which Patrick Radenkeefe wrote specifically on the Sacklers. Dope Sick focuses a lot on Dr. Phoenix and a lot on the kind of on the ground stuff. And then there's a book called Dreamland, which talks about the Mexican cartel's role in all of this, Ooh. in moving it from the East Coast to the Midwest, because Purdue Pharma, for their sins, really did just focus on the East Coast. And then it was an Appalachia, and then Appalachia. Um, and then it was the Mexican cartel that dragged it out West um, and into Indianapolis and Chicago and a lot of other places. So um, all of that to be said, we will be very angry <laughs> through this and the remaining episodes. We will open our mouths and bees will come out. That is the vibe we are often going for here. Everybody is complicated in this to me, except for Richard Sackler. <laughs> um, but even he's complicated and I am being unkind. So he mm -hmm. is, he is carrying the weight of an idea of legacy that we find very patri, very big part of the patriarchy system that we all live in this obsession with legacy that a lot of men in particular are um, required to care about culturally. Mm -hmm. um, and he's got a lot on his plate and like, you couldn't pay me to be in that family. His, the Sacklers make the family on succession look kind. Oh so, my God. <laughs> like, yeah, they really do. Um, they are a mess and a half. So oh no. oh, it's crazy. Mm, it's nuts. So all of those caveats to begin with this yeah. episode, I thought did a really great job of explaining some of the moving pieces. Yeah. Um, but the kind of subtle thing it does too, is it gives you this grand jury investigation in 2002 and we're sitting here in 2021 and you can still get Oxy from the pharmacy. So you know that these folks have not been taken down. Yeah. Um, and I like that upfront, like, Hey guys, this as angry as you're about to get, they're still making and selling this thing. Mm -hmm. There's still people dying from this every day. This is still a gateway drug to addiction. Um, to much more serious addiction, especially opioids go directly into heroin. For anyone who doesn't know, the opiate class of drugs of which Oxycontin is one, kind of the most extreme version of it is, is heroin. And the, there are many people who die directly from an Oxycontin overdose. There are about as many statistically that die because they've moved on to intravenous heroin. 
Yeah. Um, and so kind of that's the that's the the train here. So when you hear about an opioid epidemic in America, you may also hear about a heroin epidemic. They are the same thing. They are very connected. Yeah. Um, so I appreciate that up front we're told that this monster is still a monster because it kind of this is not a David and Goliath story. It tempers your expectations a little bit. And I uh, narratively appreciate that because what we're everything we're about to watch again is like rage inducing. Mm. It is so hard, especially Betsy's particular decline is very difficult to watch. And Caitlin Deaver acts the living shit out of it. Um, it's very like I had to that, the scene. The only scenes I had to turn away from were the ones that Caitlin Deaver was in because um, she was just so authentic to how I know addicts um, struggle and behave and, and the mannerisms and everything else. So very, very, very excellently done. Um, but these guys are still out there. They still have millions and billions and billions of dollars. Purdue Pharma still exists. There have been some significant class action lawsuits recently. I have hope that the DOD is, and DOJ are, DOJ are going to bring criminal charges because there's mm. a lot of evidence. Um, but it hasn't happened yet. And yeah. no one is in jail. And that's an important thing to walk into this, docu this docudrama with. Yeah. Is knowing that no one has faced the punishment you're going to want them to face. And I think, like, it, the, you're right. It does such a great job of putting all the pieces together. And, you know, you can extrapolate other examples of, of this is how drugs get made. This is how drugs get sold. This is how the government operates. This is how regulatory agencies, you know, go about this. And, and we meet in this episode uh, Rosario Dawson's character, Bridget, who works at the DEA. And she's on some drug bust in the late 90s. Um, and there's a crap ton of heroin. And then, or coke, I don't know, um, a powdered substance. And then there's a bag full of pills. And that's where she starts to investigate OxyContin. Um, and it hadn't come onto her radar yet. And I think, like, that scene for me and what the show does, I think, so well. But that scene particularly, because she starts to call all these local... Um, sheriff's office, police departments, and ask them if they'd heard of OxyContin and if it was causing them problems. And what she starts to do is write down how drug abuse and drug addiction spills into all these other facets of life. Yep. And so, you know, she hadn't heard of OxyContin yet, but she called all these places and the rates of child abandonment, abandonment are higher. Uh, you know, Petty crime, armed petty robbery. Crime. Yeah, armed robbery. That's what I was trying to think of. I was like, bank robbery? No, but like armed robbery, petty yeah. crime. Um, homelessness, well, job homelessness. abandonment. Yeah, all of these kinds of things. Um, the ripple effects of, of the disease of addiction. Um, and I think for me that's such an important part because the numbers of people using and, and addicted to Oxy are, are quite staggering. But what the show does such a beautiful job of telling you is that, you know, it's not just the, the addict, the addicts that are impacted by this. Um, and yeah. I, it, Mike, while well, I was watching, i uh, rewatching this, um, with my mom and she was doing some research while we were watching and she found, uh, an article that said that literally every state in the nation has sued Purdue Pharma at this point because of the ramifications of the addiction on infrastructure, yep. jobs, transportation. Like, that's their argument. They're like, okay, cool. So there's all these car accidents now. You know, we've had a huge rise in sex trafficking mm -hmm. and sex work. Like, all of these other yeah, there was, social there's issues. One town, like, there's one town in Missouri, and I can't remember... Um, but I was talking to an addiction specialist a couple years ago, and they said their high school dropout rate ran up 400% in the 2000s. Just one high school, 400%. Yeah, so I mean, uh, they give you in this episode a real clear line of who the baddies are. <laughs> yes. A real clear line, um, but they also... Like, what I continue to love about this show, and we haven't, obviously not all the episodes have dropped yet, and we haven't watched all of them either, um, is that they are so good at humanizing what this looks like. Yep. And you get this through 
you know, you get this through Rosario Dawson's character, who by the time she is found by the two uh, U.S. attorneys for Virginia, um, Randy and Peter Sarsgaard, I can't remember Peter Sarsgaard's character's name, but Randy is hilarious. Um, she's deeply embittered. The DEA investigation went tits up, at, you know, and we haven't found out why yet because then they backtrack. But we meet her, and she was very earnest in trying to deal with this and politics. It's almost got in painful the way. watching her. Yeah. And you're like, oh, yeah. you sweet summer child. I know. <laughs> like, you, you, it's it's hard. Yeah. And then you get Betsy, who you know <sighs> is struggling with. Uh, being a gay girl in a small mining town and being a woman in a mine and, you know. My only criticism of the show is, like, did you have to, like, did Betsy have to be all of those things? (laughs) (laughs) Like, like, okay. Like, could she have been all the intersections? Yeah, okay, cool. Did you Um, you also need to make her, like, an amputee who's colorblind? (laughs) Like, what? I was like, guys, we could have, okay. I mean, queer life in mining towns is a thing, but she's not addicted because she's queer. So, like. No, but she's traumatized because she's. She is completely. But again, I was just like, oh, man. Okay. We did, we did, we, the only addict we really spend time with as of five episodes in is like all of the tick boxes. Is all of the tick boxes. Yeah. Okay, guys, that's my only criticism so far. I know. And like. We, when we watched the first, we watched the first, like, four and a half episodes together, and we were like, is Caitlyn Deaver okay? Because the only other thing we know her from is unbelievable, and I was like, girl, I love that you're choosing these roles, but, like, I hope you find joy other places. I hope you <laughs> like, just live in a palace of kittens. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, and you know, I, no disrespect to her. I, I admire her so much for choosing these roles and for taking them on. And she's so good at what she does. But I also just want to send her flowers. Yeah, constantly. <laughs> and, and I'll say it. And she does the research. It's really clear. Oh um, God, she's she does in it, the man. work. She yeah. does the work. And and again, um, I can't find anyone who's faulting her performance. And if they had, I would have breathed fire upon them. So I'm glad they aren't. Yeah, and so we get these people. Um, the the show does such a great job of of giving us the insights from all these perspectives, and then we get Doctor Phoenix, who is, you know, a good mm. guy, a small town doctor, who wants to help people. Yep. Um, and his story for me, I think, might even be more heartbreaking than Betsy's. Fair. Um. For. Because what you get from him, not in this episode, but in coming episodes, spoiler alert, is how doctors were manipulated by Purdue to, you know, prescribe, uh, over-prescribe, get their patients addicted to Oxy. And um, we do get in this episode, um, Dr. Phoenix at the, testifying at the grand jury, and they were asking him about like the you know what we're more than your pa- we're more than one percent of your patients addicted to oxy, and he just he stops and he says I I can't I can't believe how many of them are dead now. Yeah, I remember the first time I heard the one percent addiction thing, I actually snorted out the soda I was drinking because I like one percent of my brother's high school graduating class was addicted. Like yeah. Yeah, uh, it's, that's the, that is actually one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. And we're going to yeah. find out later in the series <sighs> where we got that, how that all comes from. And, and so we won't spoil that all now. Wait for my rage on that one. Yeah, I've been sitting with that one for a decade. So <laughs> Dr. Aaron's, Dr. Aaron's rage is fresh and it's delicious. You'll you enjoy see, it so much. You want to see the bees coming out of my mouth when we get to that revelation. Wait, wait till we get to that. So it's... I will say as somebody who loves people who have been in this world for a long time, one of the holiest things about this series is that I get to talk about it now with people. And these things that a lot of us who intersect with, and I I think this is the same way I, you know, listening to a podcast this morning as we drove, as I drove into work on the troubled teen industry, um, which it's one of those things that now I know what it is. It's like everywhere I'm talking, there's, there's lots (laughs) of people talking about it. Um, but it's like, there's a lot of us who know some of these really ugly intersections of the world and we know yeah. them intimately. And we know there's some of us that carry many of them. Um, and you're never, I joke that I'm terrible at cocktail parties, but 
I don't, I, uh, most of my stories, uh, my life stories on some level involve trauma. Like, well, this one time when I was in Ethiopia, well, why were you in Ethiopia? Well, we were bringing medical supplies for the famine. <laughs> It's, I've held children in my arms as they breathe their last breath. That's pretty shitty. Like, and I'm not gonna, that wasn't any, that was in another, another location. But a lot of, a lot of my, my life has been holding these traumas for other people. And I've been very careful to try to not re-traumatize people at dinner parties with my stories. <laughs> and the addiction one is one of the ones that's been the hardest for me to hold my tongue on. Yeah. Because it affects absolutely everybody in everybody. some way, shape, or form. And in the same way, like, the COVID affects everybody. I, I've i been saying for months now, like, if we would, like, in a certain way, my very cynical self, of course we're not going to handle the COVID pandemic well because we've been screwing the pooch on the opioid epidemic and pandemic, as it has now very honestly become, um, for decades. Yeah. We've been ignoring this for decades. So what... And ju just as many people are dead from that as were dying in the beginning of COVID. So I don't have my very cynical self, any evidence that we're going to do better. Yeah. And in a, in a way, this show is so just like, Hey, here's the mess. Here's why the problem didn't get solved. Here's why it's still not solved. Here's all the layers of this, because as much as the FDA is wonderful at keeping us safe, we look at the Johnson and Johnson scandal in the 80s and how they acted really quickly in Tylenol and they're really great with food recalls. There is a lot of regulatory red tape where if you know the right person, you can cut through some shit. Yeah, and I think. And that's a hard thing for all of us to balance, too, especially those of us who know the FDA intimately. Um, I know a lot of people that work for the FDA who are super earnest. Right. And are really, really passionate about keeping... I know people at pharma companies who would never work for Purdue, ever. And they talk about Purdue as the thing they will never become. I've sat in meetings with big pharma and they have said, we will never become Purdue. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's it's a good point to, to bring up about the FDA as well, because we learn uh, later in the series, um, but this is not a big spoiler, um, that a lot of it has to do with the deregulation uh, and mm -hmm. the stripping back of regulatory agencies. Um, so the FDA, you know, there, sure, there's, you know, there's people like Curtis Wright um, in every organization, but it's also an exceptionally under-resourced and overworked administration, and they can only do so much. And uh, as you're watching any... this, sorry, go ahead. Uh, it's fine. Go ahead. As you're watching this, also know that in the last five years, they've been stripped back by a third as well. So as you're watching this, the the FDA was understaffed in 2002. They are even more significantly understaffed now because the, the deregulation didn't just happen. It keeps happening. And whatever your feelings on government spending are, know that that is a consequence. Yeah, the consequence is that they they don't have the resources to regulate things and that we eventually get to, I would think it's in episode two, um, where, you know, we learn that the consequence of this is that there's nobody really watching the pharma companies with their advertisements. There's no regulation mm -hmm. on them. It runs on the honor system. Um, and, you know, as, as much as we know, a lot of people who wouldn't violate that honor system, it's very clear very early on that Purdue did it, um, knew they were doing it and did it, continued to do it in order to make profits. And so, uh, that's what I said, like the baddie in this is, is really, really clear. We can, um, problematize and complicate every other group of humans involved in this story. <laughs> I don't think we can with, with Purdue. Purdue's a challenge. Um, and the other thing that everybody should know, too, is that um, a lot of families affected by Oxy, Purdue's not a name that they knew. It was a, yeah. I believe it's the New Yorker, um, finally did a piece in like 2012 or something. Yeah. And it was the first time anyone truly understood who Purdue Pharma was because they right. are privately held. And so I know families I've set, we actually later on in the, in the series, we meet a mother who is like this. And I know lots of parents who have, who after their kid dies, um, I, I hate the phrase. A lot of parents have done this after their kid died. Anyway, um, they want to sue somebody 
and they want to fight and they want to do something. And for years it was against a boogeyman. Yeah. Because nobody knew who Purdue was. And it wasn't really until that, that first article, which I believe is also called Empire of Pain. We will find it and link it in all the coverage of this show so that you guys can read it. It is, it is what taught me essentially who killed a lot of my friends. Right. And very quickly, it, it very quickly, I shifted from being loving addicts is complicated. And even if you understand that it's addiction, you get mad at the addict a lot and you, you, it's a, there's a lot of emotions, but once I read that article, I'll be really honest. I was never, ever mad at an opioid addict again. Cause I would mm. just look at that and be like, Oh, the Sacklers killed you. Mm. Got it. No problem. The Sacklers killed you. Um, and yeah, and I know a lot of people that are tired of going to funerals for, for this and, and I, I'm not alone in that, but yeah, it's, <clears throat> it's a messy ass story for me, for everybody, but Richard Sackler. <laughs> <laughs> to, to be, to be honest. Yeah. And I think, you know, we talked about it as we were watching it together, um, and it can't be understated enough how important it is for people to be seen and to feel yep. that they're seen and not alone in this story um, and in any story. And, like, that's what we are doing here, right, with this YouTube channel, with this podcast, uh, with the work at Abbey Research. We're, like, sitting with other people's stories and recognizing their humanity. And that's when we watched the first couple episodes of this show and we realized that that's what they were doing and that was kind of the core driving force behind their storytelling. That's when we knew we had to talk about it. Yeah. That's a wrap on episode one, guys. We want to thank you for joining us for this conversation. We've got uh, seven more coming your way about this show and we hope that you join us for those as well. If you or someone you love has been affected by this and you would like to talk about it and hear your and have your story heard, please know that that is always available to you via us. Please feel free to reach out in the YouTube comments or get in contact with the email on the podcast. And we would love to have a chat with you about um, potentially interviewing you or having you join us here on the YouTube channel to share your experience. This is a far reaching toxic octopus and we'd love to shine as much light on it as we can. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next for episode two.